All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, I'm going to kind of bring a, in a way, you might think it's a little negative message, kind of like my one two weeks ago was somewhat on the negative side of things, but I think, uh, you know, if we get what I believe we're praying for and is coming, we won't have time for this later. So we need to get grounded in these things now, because right now there's not that much of a, a temptation, but when this place is full, overflowing, things are happening, that's when the danger, you need to be grounded before that happens. And so I'm going to be uh, talking about a, if you open your Bibles to Second Samuel chapter 11, it's a very familiar story with most of us, and I'm going to try to bring out some extra things in it. Two weeks ago, I had used a description out of 1 Corinthians 10, 6, where Paul tells the church, says, these things happen as warnings to prepare us so we will not desire evil things. And so he, and what he was referring to was basically the Old Testament, the Torah, the prophets, and all the, the historical books of what happened throughout Israel's history. And so it's, it's kind of like saying, learn these lessons. You know, it's much easier for you to learn somebody else's mistakes than for you to actually have to walk it out and walk that out and pay the price for it. And so I've kind of titled this, Forgiven, But There Are Consequences. Okay, especially as we're talking about leadership, because you're not just affecting yourself, you're, you're affecting others. And we've seen that, uh, well, all throughout church history, but especially in the last two or three decades, one after another, falling into some type of sin, something happening. And when that happens, it not only takes that person down, but many times they take a whole congregation down. So we need to be forewarned and be prepared and just go back into his word. So we're just going to kind of go through this, chapter 11, 2 Samuel. Again, common story that everyone knows about David and Bathsheba. So we'll start in verse 1, and it says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men, and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. So it says it's in the time of war where kings go out to war. But you notice David did not go out for war. He stayed back in Jerusalem. It's kind of like, you know, it's kind of hard out there. You know, you're living in tents, you're living off the land, and it's battle, and it's, you know, things are really nice here in Jerusalem. I'll just send Joab and the army. They'll take care of it, okay? So instead of him going out to where he was supposed to be, he stayed in Jerusalem, and he opened himself up to what was going to happen. So in verse 2, it says, One evening David got up from his bed, and he walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. Now, the woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't, that, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now, she had purified herself from her uncleanliness. Then she went back home, and the woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David finds himself in a problem. He's committed adultery, sin, and now she is pregnant, and he's got a problem. What am I, I going to do with this? How am I going to? This is not good. So in verse 6, it says, So David sent the word to Joab. He said, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent him to David. Now, when Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was and how the soldiers 
were and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house, wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with all his master's servants, and he did not go down to his house. So what David was trying to do, he was going to have Uriah come back. He's going to send him, you know, home so that it will cover up, he thinks, cover up his sin. Won't be recognized that, no, this is actually his baby. So that didn't work because in verse 10 it says, When David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, Haven't you just come in from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. So can you see the integrity of, of Uriah's heart? You know, he wasn't going to enjoy the privilege of coming back when the rest of the troops were out in the field living in tents in the middle of a battle. So he refused to go, which creates another problem for David. So in verse 12, it says, Then David said to him, Stay here one more day and tomorrow, and I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants, and he did not go home. So David tried to get him drunk, thinking that he'll go home, solve the problem. He didn't do it. So verse 14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is the fierce. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. And when the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. So Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, When you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, and the king's anger may flare up, And he may ask you, why did you go so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jeroboam? Didn't a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the walls so that he died at Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If you ask you this, then say to him, also your servant Uriah the Hittite, is dead. So the messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had said to him. The messenger said to David, The men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men are dead. Moreover, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. So David told the messenger, say this to Joab. Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as the other. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. Now when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And after that time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Kind of like you think, you know? Now, Uriah the Hittite was probably from the uh, 
city-state of the Hittites was in northern Syria. But it's funny, his name means Light of Yahweh. That's a pretty cool name, Light of Yahweh. Now, you don't need to turn there, but in 2 Samuel 23, verse 39, it says, One of David's mighty men, and it lists all 37 of them, and Uriah is one of his mighty men. So he wasn't just a soldier, you know, low level. He was one of David's mighty men, and we see his character already. And also says that in 1 Chronicles eleven forty one, He's also on that list. And it's interesting that in Matthew, the New Testament, Matthew 1, verse 6, where uh, that chapter where they're giving the genealogy of Jesus, it says that David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. So Uriah made it into the New Testament. He's listed there. So Uriah was a great man. And you think, you know, sometimes bad things happen to good people. And what's really sad is sometimes bad things happen to good people from good people, from leadership that have done something. And in this case, basically, David did a contract killing. He, he didn't do it himself, but he put him in that position so he knew he would be killed. So very serious And so I want to go and look in chapter 12. We're going to read part of chapter 12, not the whole chapter, because we want to find out what's gone on. So David has taken Bathsheba, his wife, tried to cover it up, couldn't. And so we start in chapter 1 of 12, or 12, verse 1. It says, The Lord sent Nathan to David. Now, Nathan was the, the prophet, David's prophet, okay? So when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. Now the rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. So, Nathan tells him this kind of story, parable. And David says in verse 5, David burned with anger against the man. And he said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did not have, he did not such a thing, because he did not did such a thing, he had no pity. So he tells him that story. And again, David, anger burns because he's, he's really upset about that. This is not fair. This is wrong. Something needs to be done. And then Nathan says to David, verse 7, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if all this was too little, I would have given you more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So when he says, the sword will never depart from your house, because you despised me 
And then he goes on in verse 11 and says, this is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to one as close to you. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. You did it in secret. But I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. And we're not going to turn there, but how this was fulfilled was Absalom, his own son, was raised up and tried to take the kingdom from David, and he attacked Jerusalem, and David had to flee. He left his ten, ten of his wives, or ten concubines, to take care of the house. And then as, as Absalom comes in, he actually pitched a tent on top by the temple, and took his ten, David's ten concubines there and had sexual relations with them during the day. And everybody in, the, you know, in Jerusalem knew what was happening. And so that was actually fulfilled. So in, in verse 13, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin." You are not going to die. So see, the Lord forgave him, said he took away your sins, so he was forgiven, but there were consequences of the sin. Verse 14, but because by doing this, you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, the son born to you will die. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had borne to David, and he became ill. Now David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the night lying on the ground. The elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground, but he refused, and he would not eat any food with them. Now, on the seventh day, the child died. Now, David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was dead, for they thought, while this child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. In other words, he had fasted during the seven-day period, laying on the ground, praying, interceding. And so the elders were worried about, well, if we tell him he's died, the child died, he might do something harmful to himself. And so in verse 19, David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead. Is the child dead, he asked? Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground After he had washed, he put on lotion, changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord, and he worshiped. Then he went to his own house, and at his request, they served him food, and he ate. His servants asked him, why are you acting like this? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept. But now that his child is dead, you get up and eat. He answered, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. So there were again some pretty serious consequences that came as a result of David's sin. And it's interesting at the same time, you know, it says that, that, that David is a man after God's own heart. But again, sin has consequences, especially for leadership. You know, it's like James 3, 1 says, let not many of you become teachers because you're going to uh, undergo a stricter judgment. So there is a higher level of judgment 
for those who are in that place of leadership. Now, 1 Kings 15, 5, I just, you don't need to turn there, but I'll just read it real quickly. It says, For David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not failed to keep any of the Lord's command all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. And yet God was a man after God's own heart, but he also had a, a major failure, obviously, that had consequences again. But what is good about this is that after this time is when David wrote the Psalm 51. So let's go ahead and turn over to that, Psalm 51. This has happened right after Nathan had uh, confronted him, and he confessed his sin and, and realized what had happened. He wrote this, this psalm. And we're, going to, we're not going to read the whole thing. We're going to read 1 through 17, though, <clears throat> because I think it, it gives you an insight into David's heart. So even though he had tried to cover it up, even though uh, you know, all the negative things that happened, he writes this psalm, and he says, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquities, and cleanse me from my sins. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight." So that you are proven right when you speak and justify when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the innermost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be cleansed. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore in me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressions your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praises. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it you do not take pleasure in burnt offerings the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart O oh God you will not despise so the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit a broken and contrite heart O oh God you will not despise and so David's heart was broken, and he had a contrite heart. And so he was forgiven, even though there were consequences. You know, I, I remember uh, many, many years ago, back in the 80s, when uh, Bob Jones, a, a, a prophet of the Lord, and he would, he would always say, especially to the, the younger leaders, he'd talk about the three, girl, the three G's. The girls, the gold, and the glory. And as I look back over those years, there have been so many that have fallen for those very things. Whether it was of money, the finances, whether it was took into glory themselves, or whether it was uh, the girls, the sexual uh, sins. And so despite knowing that is not necessarily enough 
because we have to, you know, if you think you stand, the word says, watch yourself. You know, there's another scripture, I'll just read it to you, which kind of goes along with that. It's 1 John 2, 16. And it says, for everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has done comes not from the Father, but from the world. So you can almost put off any category or any sin in one of those categories. The cravings of sinful men, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has done comes not from the Father, but from the world. And so over those years, I've watched and seen again what happens. And again, when we're in this place where we're right now, it's pretty easy to walk pure, holy. But you'd be surprised when you start having an influx of people, when you become, start become not, you know, notarized, people are talking, people are clapping, and you know, things are happening, and you're seeing the things that we're praying for. We're seeing healings. We're seeing breakthrough. That's when you have to be careful. Because after a while, you begin to become like David and say, you know, I, I could take back a little bit. I think I'll just stay here in the comfort. You know, that spiritual warfare is kind of hard. be a lot easier for me just to kind of cruise for a while. But we have to be alert. And I remember a particular man, I'm not going to mention his, his name. Uh, I remember when he first started... Uh, he was traveling around, and we actually saw him up here at Lee Summit a couple times. And, and he had a huge, he had a powerful anointing upon him. He was a young guy, uh, and and as we saw, Glenn and I both saw saw the anointing was on him and power that was on him. But at the same time, it was like we had this check that there's no there's no one mentoring him, and. And sure enough, in a year or two years, he fell into to deep sin. He had this anointing, but he, and then when he actually, after he fell, he was trying to go into discipleship of some well-known leaders, and basically he refused uh, and would not accept that because he just believed that his anointing, his presence, you know, and he was saving people and people were getting healed. All these things were happening but it led to his self-destruction. So again, so this isn't really so much for us today as it is for the future. Because like I say, when, if we get the things that we believe are coming, we're not going to have time for this message. We're going to have to be already have this in our foundation so we can stand and not see something disastrous happen. So I just want to encourage everyone. So on the one hand, we, we're desiring this. On the other hand, be warned. You know, as Paul told him, you know, these things happen as examples for us so that we would not desire evil things. Or we might think, well, that never happened to me. Because probably everyone who fell into that would have said the same thing. That won't happen to me. It might happen to so-and-so, it won't happen to me. And none of them just fell into sin. It was little compromises that gradually come bigger compromises and then they fall. So again, that's just kind of a kind of a negative message again, but I think it's one that we just need to have grounded in us because, again, we're not going to have time when things begin to really happen because we're going to be busy and things are, you know, we're just not going to have time for that. We're going to have to really be grounded in it now. All right, so let's switch gears and let's just begin to think, see what the Lord wants to do. So I'm going to pray. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we, we treasure your word. Lord, your word is what changes hearts and minds, Lord. We love your word. And so, Lord, we do want to learn the lessons from your word. 
We want to learn from the mistakes of others. We want to prepare ourselves, Lord, to be a place, a safe place where people can come, receive healing, receive salvations, spiritual healing, physical healing, mental healing. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would help us to prepare ourselves, Lord, to be those vessels of honor and vessels of use. And so, Lord, we just ask even now, Lord, we say, come, Lord. When you walk in the room, everything changes. So, Lord, we're asking for your manifest presence to come. Lord, we're asking you to heal bodies. Lord, we're asking you to change hearts, open hearts, and do what only you can do. We're longing for the more, Lord. We ask for more love, more power, more of you in our lives, Lord. We ask for that increased anointing. We ask for the increase of the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, we ask to be carriers of your presence and your power. So, Lord, we ask, prepare us, Lord. Prepare us for those days of glory. And, Lord, that we would never take your glory upon ourselves, Lord, but we would truly give you all the glory and all the praise. So, Lord, touch us, refresh us this morning, Lord. I ask that hope would arise in people's hearts, Lord, the people who have been in a battle, Lord, that you would strengthen them this morning, that you would cause faith, to arise in their hearts. Lord, we are desperate for you. We're longing for you, Lord. Lord, you are our magnificent obsession. You are the desires of our heart, Lord. Capture us, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would break off all the distractions of the world, all the temptations, Lord, we ask is that, that uh, line at, out of the uh, Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And Lord, we love you. And Lord, as we say no to sin, we know that that's not enough, that we must say yes to something. And we're saying yes to you, Lord. Help us, O oh Lord. Come, Lord, come and do what only you can do. We love your presence, Lord. Lord, stretch forth your hand. Do a work. Do a work in our lives, in the lives of this congregation, Lord. Prepare your people, Lord. Just kind of try to steal yourself before the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I ask that you release prophetic words. Words of wisdom, words of knowledge. Lord, release your healing power. We're not in a hurry, just wait upon the Lord. Stir our hearts, Lord.
Anybody feels anything? Getting a word for somebody? Feel free to come up. The microphone. <laughs> 